future friends. Um, does my clicker work? Um, I think I need to explain, because I know there will be questions. Picture on the right is me in February, um, and picture on the right is a couple of weeks ago. Um, knee injuries suck, I would not recommend. Um, first of all, I'd like to say, um, send speedy regards to Alu. Uh, it must really suck to, um, you know, get ill just days before, uh, before the conference. Uh, so speedy recovery. And um, yeah, I'm left with really big shoes to fill, so hopefully I won't disappoint. Um, and secondly, many thanks to uh, Remy and Julie for having me here today. Um, I try to go to as many events as I can, and FFConf is by far my favorite conference. Um, this year is my sixth event. The very first one I attended was in 2015. I was a junior developer. I was so psyched. I wanted to be, you know, the next um, SEO, CEO, <laughs> CEO? Uh, CEO of Google, you know, all of that. Um, and then I heard Lana's talk, uh, talk about everything. It was to this day probably the most powerful and inspiring presentation that I've ever seen. Um, it was about responsibility that we have as techies and about uh, basically the privileged position that we're in. Um, and that talk is the reason why I've become the developer that I am and why I've chose to work uh, with nonprofit sector. Uh, so as introduced by Remy, uh, my name is Natalia. I'm a uh, front-end developer by day. Um, I work for a nonprofit called Developer, so developer Society. Uh, by night, um, I'm Batman. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm an environmentalist and environmental, environmental, environmental science student. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about tech um, and I'm going to talk about environment. Um, so I've always been like, I'm a very outdoorsy person. I've always cared for the surrounding world. Um, but obviously, like getting into tech, you end up spending majority of your time in front of a computer. And for some reason, it occurred to me that I surely have an impact on, uh, you know, on the environment, um, which sounds pretty obvious, but you just don't think about it. So I went on Twitter and I asked about, um, and that's how I've heard about um, OMG Climate and Conference, uh, which I went to. Um, I think it was like two weeks later or something. Um, it was organized by the Climate Action Tech community. And um, going to this event, I didn't really know what to expect. But I've learned so much about technologies, you know, um, impact on climate change, and just like little fix, like things like, you know, how impactful gifts are, for example, and just little things like that. And after leaving the event, I felt so partially overwhelmed um, and uh, just like so blinded with all the information, but also inspired and really obligated to take all of that with me and to uh, learn more about it. Um, so Yes, like I said, today um, I'm going to talk about climate change, uh, technology's place in it. Uh, I'm going to give some really simple solutions that um, we can do day to day and within um, our organizations to make the web and our, um, um, our industry a bit greener. Um, and just a little heads up, I'm going to talk through some upsetting stats in the beginning. Um, so I know a lot of people suffer from eco-anxiety and I, I'm sorry if that might be uh, quite upsetting, but I'm hoping, like, I'm hopefully optimistic with this talk, so um, bear with me till the end. Um, according, <laughs> um, according to the UN, we only have 10 years left to prevent irreversible um, damage from climate change, and um, 
what it means that if we don't act now, and by now I mean yesterday, uh, and the uh, global temperatures rise by one, one and a half degrees Celsius, um, will, it, they will, it will result in more dangerous disruptions to the societies and ecosystems, including longer and hotter heat waves and more frequent crop killing droughts. Uh, what is climate change, you ask? Climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns. These shifts might be natural, like volcanoes, for example. Um, volcanoes have been a major polluter, you know, way before people, people, human, have, um, could do anything about it. Um, but according to the Intergovernmental pa Panel on Climate Change, since the 1970s, human activities have been the main driver of climate change, primarily um, due to the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. Um, and those produce um, you know, heat-trapping heat um, gases and so on. Um, Global fossil CO2 emissions in 2021 20, have returned to the pre-pandemic levels of 20, <coughs> excuse me, 2019 after falling by 5.4% in 2020 um, due to obviously lockdowns and pandemic. Um, and the pre pre preliminary data shows that emissions in 2022 from January to May uh, are already above the average from 2019. Um, in the most recent seven years, uh, the most recent seven years have been the warmest there have ever been. Uh, between March and May this year, Delhi um, experienced five heat waves um, with record-breaking temperatures reaching up to 49.2 degrees Celsius, um, with half of Delhi populations living in low-income um, settlements. Um, being highly vulnerable to heat, to extreme heat. This heat wave led to devastating social, social, social economic uh, and public health impacts. Globally, by 2050, over 1.6 billion people living in over 970 cities, cities will be regularly exposed to three month average temperatures reaching at least 35 degrees Celsius. In June and July this year, uh, Europe was affected by two extreme heat waves and droughts. Um, and in July, for the first time on record, temperatures in the UK reached over 40 degrees Celsius. And according to the um, World, World Weather Attribution Initiative, it is the human caused climate change that have um, made the heat wave in the UK 10 times more are more likely to happen. 100 and billion American dollars per year. Uh, that's what it would cost to make the changes that humanity needs to adapt to, to, the, to the warming world. It might sound like a lot, but it is just a fracture. It's just 0.2% of um, global GDP. Um, and 60% of the wildlife has been lost since 1970s. Over the past two decades, nine sea levels have risen by 3.2 millimeters per annum. And um, do you remember this? Do you remember driving on a motorway like 10 years ago and you'd get into your new clean car, going on holiday, it has to be clean. You would stop at services, so it would get to where you were going and your windscreen would be covered in flies and bugs. That is, you know, that doesn't happen that much very often anymore because um, we're on course to lose over half of insects by the end of the century. Um, music streaming and just streaming in general is quite um, a big polluter as well. Um, so music streaming accounted for 200 to 350 greenhouse gas emissions in 2015 and 16 and that's only in the US. Um, so, for example, if you were to listen to an album 27 times back to back, it would, it's very likely it would be more environmentally friendly to produce, uh, to manufacture and produce that album than, you know, streaming it. So, I was thinking about it like day-to-day -day work, I listen to Spotify pretty much every day. So, 
let's say every workday I will listen to Spotify for eight hours, so that's 21 working days a month, and that will emit as much CO2 as driving nearly 20 miles by an average passenger vehicle. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a cold. Just cold, not covered. Internet is responsible for roughly 3.2 greenhouse, roughly 3.2 global greenhouse gas emissions, um, and that's through you know embodied carbon. So what's uh, you know pr uh, creating, making the devices, as well as the energy use. Um, so 3.7% is the latest data, and that roughly corresponds to aviation. So you know, just flying from one place to another. We all know how bad flying is. So putting that into perspective with how much internet is being used, I think that's, um, that's quite, quite big. And it also has the exact same, or, or roughly the same emissions as the whole of Germany. So it, internet ITC um, emissions as a whole can be put into three categories. Um, that is data centers, data transfer, and device energy. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit of details about the data centers and uh, device energy because that's a very actionable thing that we can do. And the data transfer is partially, can partially come from the improvements that we can make through the, the end user optimization. Um, but data centers need the energy to power and to be powered up and to be cooled down. And they also need um, to power massive diesel uh, generators, uh, you know, backup generators, because no one wants a server to go down and then nothing happening for a week. Um, data transfer, um, so that's uh, about powering the, uh, you know, telecom services, as well as um, how much data, how much and how big of a data is being sent and how often. Um, so with data transfer, like I mentioned, I'm not gonna get into too much details, but one of the things that we can do is to host our services near where our user um, audience, where the audience is gonna be based or use CDNs and so on. Um, and thirdly, the device energy, so that's the end user data consumption. Um, that's what we are going to focus about today. Uh, but coming, coming back to the um, data centers, um, they use 3% of the global electric supply and they're responsible for 2% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I feel like this is where we can make the biggest changes. Um, this is where the, the shift can happen, you know, as soon as tomorrow. Um, we have control over where we're hosting our sites and picking green servers uh, powered by renewable energy with tangible sustain sustainability goals is the way forward. Uh, I would try to avoid the servers that offset uh, their emissions because I don't know if you're familiar with offsetting. It's basically what it does. It, it, you build this huge thing that emits this much CO2, but let's not worry about it. We can plant trees and it's fine. You know, Shell could be carbon neutral or carbon negative as long as they, they plant enough trees. Um, and this is very tactically, um, it's basically greenwashing you can be carbon neutral or carbon negative. From like a scientific point of view, offsetting is bad. Uh, but anyway, you, um, you can find a bunch of green host hosting providers on the Green um, Web Foundation website. There is a huge directory. Um, you can look at country, by countries and zones, etc., etc. And you're probably all wondering, is FFConf website running on green energy? It is. <laughs> uh, so well done, Remy. Um, from a development point of view, it's all about uh, efficiency and performance. Um, the average web page in 2014 was only 1.6 megabytes. And in September 2022, uh, the desktop size was 2.2 uh, megabytes and 2 megabytes for mobile sites and I'm going to talk about design because I know nothing about it. 
when we're building the web, um, it's not just about coding, right? It's about how we, what we're delivering, what is the purpose of the product that we're building and what it looks like and how, um, how people interact with it. Design is the first stage of it. And doing less, making sites more efficient, um, putting less imagery, less flashing animations, less carousels, et cetera, et cetera, will be clearer design, easier to read, as well as more performant, more accessible. It will have much better user experience. And at the same time, it will, um, it will be greener. Um, from um, the engineering perspective, one way to ensure that the products we're building are sustainable, we can look at sustainable software engineering principles. Um, those are eight principles. Uh, it's about building applications that are carbon efficient, building applications that are energy efficient, consume electricity with the lowest carbon intensity, build applications that are hardware efficient. I think a lot of the time we forget about it because we're trying to be innovators. We're trying to push for the newest, the fanciest, the, you know, the coolest things. And we forget about the resilient web. We forget about the users on, you know, in developing countries who don't have devices that are brand new. We forget about users that um, don't have the accessibility that we as, as makers have to use the devices. Um, nextly, it's uh, maximizing the energy efficiency of the hardware, reducing the amount of data and distance it must travel across the network, build carbon aware applications, and focus on step-by-step -step optimization that increases the overall carbon efficiency. So this is um, like quite a straightforward step that we can take. Um, looking at imagery that we um, were putting on the web, again, less, it comes back to less being more. Um, we probably don't need hundreds of images. We don't need you know, massive TIFFs or whatever you want to put out there. Um, SVGs and CSS are much better. Uh, much smaller than images, PNGs, etc. Uh, we need to make sure we optimize images, uh, whether we're putting a limit for um, size limits for the users, what they can upload, or um, whether we're going to put some sort of optimization from our side. Um, we can try using um, different image formats. Uh, WebP, for example, um, is 30% smaller than JPEG and has, I believe, 96% browser support. Um, you can, you know, polyfill it. If it's not supported, use JPEG. It's all doable. Um, and then, I don't know how to pronounce it. AVIF, I'll go with that, is 50% less, 50% uh, smaller than JPEGs and has about 67% uh, of browser support as of a um, few days ago. Um, and of course, make sure you lazy load the images. Um, videos, again, do we need it? Everyone hates autoplaying videos. And when our clients say that we really want to put this swanky new video in, you know, as soon as someone opens the website, we all die inside. We all do. <laughs> we can explain from a, you know, for, even from a marketing perspective that you know it's not good for the users. It's inaccessible, and it's just going to cost a lot. It's going to cost more money in terms of how much um, storage we would need, and so on. Um, if you need to put a video, don't know how to play it. But again, do you really need it? Um, and then coming back to um, actually, what has been mentioned earlier on, do we need all the tracking scripts? Um, do we need chat boxes? And do we need ads? Those are, none of that is necessary. None of that is going to make anyone, anyone's life easier. And it's going to be just additional garbage that we're loading on the site, um, making it less and less performant and inaccessible. So, once I finish building a site, I will probably go through, you know, look at Lighthouse or whatever testing you do to check if it's, if it's all good. 
what about sites that have already been published? Um, we can go to the original website, Carbon Calculator, that was built by team in, um, by Whole Grain Digital, I believe, um, which is a really good, um, really good tool to use. So I was going to do live testing, but I'm not going to. So I've pre-tested FFConf website, um, and luckily it's 95 uh, cleaner than um, all of the pages tested. Um, it produces only 10, 0 .10, 0 0.4 grams of CO2 every time someone's visited the website, and it is running on the uh, sustainable energy. Again, I forgot to put it in my notes, but um, one of the founders of uh, Climate Action Tech, Chris, whose name I forgot, built this amazing tool um, for calculating um, carbon footprint of sending data. So I've tested uh, FFConf website for the past 30 days. Uh, I believe I've used the correct number. Um, and it emits uh, 4.575 uh, kilograms of CO2 per month, so in the last 30 days. <coughs> Excuse me. And it is the equivalent of uh, 556 numbers of smartphones charged. Um, it's also equivalent of 5.1 pounds of uh, coal burned and um, driving nearly, uh, driving just over 11 miles by an average gasoline powered vehicle. <coughs> so, operations, day to day, um, we can do a lot as individuals writing our code, but we have been made feel that we are personally responsible for climate change, which is bullshit. We all know that. This isn't our fault. This is the fault of, you know, giants and fossil fuel corporations. But um, we can change the world by making small little changes, like optimizing our code, et cetera, et cetera. But we can also try driving systematic changes within the organizations that we work at. And, um, you know, back in, what was it, 2018, when the GDPR legislation came out, we all appointed GDPR chief officer in the office. Um, something that I said about before is um, we can do the same thing with the environment. We can appoint someone who could be leading that change within the organizations that we work at. Um, so we can find someone or that person can step up to be the environmental officer and um, we can write legislate not legislation, we can write like internal policies, what we can do as an organization to be a bit greener. Some of the things that we can do that don't really have much of an impact on our day-to-day -day work is, um, <coughs> I'm so sorry about the cold. Um, <coughs> we can opt for, um, plant-based catering um, during our like team meetings or client meetings. I know everyone held, hates the word vegan, etc. But from a carbon perspective, opting for um, plant-based dinner, plant-based catering is going to have a, a massive difference. Equally, choosing um, low-carbon travel options for. Uh, traveling to events, conferences, client meetings, etc. We probably don't need to, you know, fly from Manchester to London. We could take a train and just, you know, watch some downloaded Netflix on our devices. Um, there's been a team, I can't remember where that team is based. Uh, they were trying to do a bit more for the environment uh, within, within their organization. Um, and they have set up um, um, composting in the office. Um, there is an app called Share Waste where you can let people know that you've got some composting. They can come in and take it for their own co compost or you can ask for people to bring you their own 
waste. <laughs> they so they set up this. They set up composting within their office. That's another way of you know trying to, to do something, but uh, that comes to a bit of extremes. Um, so um, so my clicker doesn't work. I'm going to move to. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of work that is already happening in this space um, from um, our peers. So Climate Action Tech, um, they're a great community. They're on Slack and Discord, uh, et cetera. Um, they're basically a community of technologists who are trying to make um, the web a bit greener. Um, last year, they've run uh, Let's Green the Web uh, campaign. Uh, which was basically about making the web greener, self-explanatory. Um, principles of sustainable software engineering, that's another open source project uh, that is really, really worth looking into. Um, and then there's um, different uh, extensions like Carbonalyzer, I think that's a Firefox one. Uh, and I forgot the name of the app that I hid behind the book. Uh, but then there is sustainable web design book written by Tom Greenwood that's, um, that's also really good. I'd highly recommend it. <coughs> so we sort of only have 10 years left, but I think we still have 10 years left. I think we can still take those little changes at work, day-to-day um, -day jobs, you know, just optimize that extra bit of code, uh, don't import unnecessary, you know, um, packages if you don't need to, and uh, let's work towards making um, the web a bit greener. Thank you. <laughs>